In the uh, 1960s, my first guest founded a band called the Mothers of Invention, and through live performances and as such albums as Weasels Ripped My Flesh <laughs> and Burnt Weenie Sandwich, he established a reputation as, br as a brilliant musician and an exciting performer. This is an album of his uh, latest work, ladies and gentlemen, Zappa Volume 1. We're delighted to have him back with us tonight. Please welcome Frank Zappa. Nice to see you again. I want to thank you uh, for coming by last night and helping us out. And, and when you were here last night, you said that when you came back tonight, there was something you wanted to talk about. Do you remember what you said that was? Yeah, I thought that one of the important uh, topics that we could discuss in a show such as you've been conducting tonight, and if this really fits in, is brown lipstick in the corporate suite. <laughs> Brown lipstick in the corporate suite. Yeah. All right, you go first. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think that nobody really looks good with brown lipstick on. So why do these guys in the corporate suite keep wearing it? And how does it get there? This is one of the problems facing us today. And what do you think? Uh, have you run into this a lot, Frank? Yeah. And it's I was at CBS yesterday. CBS. And, and men and women alike were wearing the brown lipstick. They do. Boy, I don't know. <laughs> See, you're lucky. You have the little blue cards to go like that. That's right. I can, I can keep that from happening. Uh, we, we have uh, folks who have come specifically to the I, show tonight I saw to hear about uh, your latest album, the London Symphony Orchestra, performing heretofore unrecorded Frank Zappa works. How do you get the London Symphony Orchestra to do your stuff? You pay them. Yeah. <laughs> But isn't this a really prestigious organization? Of course. So you pay them a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, did uh, you flew to London to do this? Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I read something from the liner note here? Good. Musical information. This is the first recorded performance of these works. Uh, it goes on. Uh, as with every performance of new music, errors will occur. Every effort has been made to remove these, but without a much larger budget, for rehearsal and recording time, the possibility of perfection in a premiere situation such as this is somewhat remote. Now, what, is, what does that mean exactly? That means that any time somebody writes a piece of music that nobody's ever seen before, and you hand that music to a musician, unless they have sufficient time to rehearse it and get all the details worked out, the chances of an absolutely perfect performance are not good. Mm -hmm. And given the amount of money that I had to spend to produce an album of orchestral music, and the fact that uh, I had a fixed amount of time because of their schedule to do this, that it would be humanly impossible to play works of this complexity absolutely perfect. Yes. But we tried. Now, uh, how close did you get? I would say that uh, considering the amount of editing that was done to remove bad notes played by various people, that we're up to about 75% on this record. Well, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Is? Not too bad. Now, did you, did you feel uh, uh, driven by integrity to put this on here, or is this common procedure? No, that's, that was just, uh, I have a personal relationship with my fans where I don't mess around. Yeah. And I wanted to let them know that if they listened to this and expected that that was exactly the way it was supposed to be, it's not. It yeah. can be played better but only in a situation where somebody spends more time to rehearse it. Uh, is, is it possible that uh, at some point you would go back with bigger budget and more rehearsal time and do it again, or is this it? Well, you have to understand how I get my budgets. You know, how do you get them? I get them from fans spending money for buying records. Yeah. If a certain amount of money comes in, then I'll turn that money around and I'll do another project. I spent everything that I could spend to do that. So. It's doubtful that I will be making another record of those works. Another yeah. orchestra may record it, but I can't afford to do it. Yeah, well, uh, it, you know, it's very refreshing that you have that approach. I mean, just pretty well, much I explaining that, to the folks what's going on. I think it should be fair with, yeah. especially people who come here wearing shorts and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to, uh, we got to go away for a commercial. Uh, we'll be right back, though, to continue talking with Frank Zappa. <laughs> Uh, Frank Zappa is here. Uh, we mentioned the album. The digital, by the way. Is there any way you can quickly explain to me what this means as opposed to the old uh, uh, steam-powered recordings we, <laughs> we played as kids? It means that the original tapes for this uh, recording were made on a, a digital medium with no tape hiss and more refined sound. And this is state-of-the-art stuff, right? It's the good stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, you also, I was uh, reading some things about you this afternoon. 
Uh, and in, in one newspaper interview, you mentioned that you'd like to have your own talk show. Around 1968, I tried to do that. I um, set out to convince people in television that I should talk to people on TV. And uh, I gave a list of the kinds of people that, uh, you know, when I made my proposal to the TV people, I would say, I would have these kind of people on. What kind were they? Well, I don't remember who it was, but they didn't like the list, that was for sure. Who did, who did you make this proposal to? Uh, I think it was NBC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. That's uh, kind of surprising. They wouldn't go along with you. Uh, uh, There's no accounting for taste. Really. Now, now but, but just take a second here and think again. Uh, <laughs> maybe this is putting you on the spot, but who mm -hmm. would you, if you had a show, really, would you be interested in, in letting America take a better look at? Well, what I would have done at that time would be to take people who were in politics and put them on um, next to each other on a couple of chairs with people from uh, rock and roll or from the arts or you know, just people that you wouldn't normally expect to confront each other and uh, let them hack it out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it, it was always a kind of a, not necessarily a dream, but an interest of mine that if you had a talk show, and as it turns out, I have one. Um, you lucky guy. <laughs> but uh, to get somebody, uh, not unlike the, the, the gentleman we pantsed earlier tonight, uh, bring them down and maybe once a month, once a week, whatever, just let them, you know, talk. Mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes to find out what the guy does for a living, how are things going, and, and uh, uh, what is affecting this person uh, that we see on the front page of the newspaper. I think so that's a perfect format, and I think that somebody should do it, because uh, people who watch talk shows would probably like to be on them. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that people who come to a live audience like this would probably like to just jump up here and start talking about whatever was on their mind. And, and probably, because they have been watching talk shows for years, yeah. be very good at it. Yeah, and also because they saw things on talk shows that made them so bored that they knew they could do better. Yeah. So they should get a chance to do it. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, maybe we'll do that one night. Uh, let me ask you about your relationship with a, an, another one of our guests, uh, Captain Beefheart. I went to high school with him, and I haven't seen him in quite some time. I think the last time I saw him was about two years ago when he stopped by one of our rehearsals. And you guys had worked together early? Yeah, we did... Um, well, when we were still in high school, we used to, uh, he had to quit because his father got sick. And I was a senior and he was already out of school and helping uh, with the family out because his father was sick. And I used to spend a lot of time over at his house listening to rhythm and blues records. And uh, that was all there was to do in Lancaster. Mm -hmm. and then, Lancaster? California. And uh, that's one of those kind of places where if you say the name of that town, nobody will ever clap. You, get, <laughs> you say Brooklyn, you know, somebody makes some noise. Lancaster, California is different. And it's really bleak out there. So we used to listen to rhythm and blues records all night, and then he would go into his, his father drove a Helms bakery truck, and he used to crawl out there and get pineapple buns out of the truck, and we'd eat those in the middle of the night. <laughs> and later on, uh, after he had formed a band, I had formed a band, and his band broke up and he wasn't doing any work. Uh, I asked him to work in my band for a while. He did one tour with us and made one album with us. But since that time, he's put another group back together and has been recording yeah. for Warner. He's a very interesting man to talk to, isn't he? He's a strange person. Yeah. Uh, did you give him his name? Actually, the name came from a comment made by his, I believe it was his uncle. And it, it's connected with a somewhat obscene situation where the uncle was exposing himself to uh, his uh, girlfriend who was living in, an, in the house at that time. And then the character of Captain Beefheart was derived from this particular comment. And then a, screen, a screenplay was written called Captain Beefheart versus the Grunt People. That's where the character came from. And then and he adopted the name for uh, his band. Knows a good name when he hears it. Sure does. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier this this album, by the way, a potential collector's item. Six thousand copies were. Yeah, pressed. we only press six thousand this because this is not a rock and roll record, and there's no way that it's you know, going to be on the radio or be on the charts. So there was not a a large uh, pressing order for this. So if you like that kind of stuff, better get it. There ain't going to be too many of them sitting around. Oh, uh, and and from the money that you get out of this, what do you have any plans for the next project? <laughs> there won't be any profit out of this. <laughs> now, Frank, come on. You can't. Uh, uh, it's that, impossible. Well, uh, good luck to you nonetheless. And uh, any time... <laughs> uh, any time you want to come by and say hello, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Frank Zappa, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll be right back to take a look at flags from around the world.